Before we begin with control variables, let's briefly go over the mathematical model that relates pressure, volume, and flow during ventilation. This model is known as the equation of the dynamics of the respiratory apparatus or the equation of motion. It describes how the ventilator moves air into the lungs. In other words, the equation describes the amount of pressure required to drive air into the lungs at certain flow rate to achieve a required tidal volume based on the respiratory compliance and resistance of patients' lungs. If we look at the equation, only one of the variables from the equation of motion can be predetermined. Volume, flow, and pressure are the only variables which can be predetermined in this way. However, flow cannot be a control variable because flow is volume over time, and thus when volume is controlled, flow is controlled indirectly. And, of course, rest of the parameters on the right side of the equation are determined by patients' respiratory conditions. So, ventilators can be seen as devices that shape the pressure or volume waveform. We call pressure or volume the control variable or independent variable because it remains constant despite changes in lung compliance or resistance. The other variable, which changes in response, is the dependent variable. To determine the control variable, we identify which one stays constant. So control variables in mechanical ventilation are independent parameters which are targeted by the ventilator mechanism and upon which all other variables are dependent. The ventilator uses control variable as of the feedback signal for controlling inspiration. The word control means that the person setting the ventilator focuses on managing this specific variable without allowing the respiratory system to influence it. As mentioned, volume and pressure are used as control variables. We need to distinguish that terms like volume controlled and pressure controlled ventilation refer to different control variables, not different ventilator modes. The ventilator mode is determined by the characteristics or settings of control variables and phase variables together. Another thing to distinguish is that control variable is not same as limit variable of inspiratory phases. While control variable exclusively controls or limits one parameters of interest, limits are set to make sure all the other dependent variables don't go out of control in the process of achieving the control variable. Let's evaluate the pressure as a control variable first. When pressure is controlled in ventilation mode, the waveform of the pressure time curve remains unchanged in response to variations in the respiratory impedance of the system. In contrast, the volume time and flow time curves undergo changes in both waveform and values depending on compliance of the respiratory system. If we think of it in term of independent and dependent variable, Peak airway pressure is the independent variable, and tidal volume, peak inspiratory flow and mean inspiratory flows are dependent variables. When volume is controlled in ventilation mode, the waveform of the volume time and inspiratory flow time curves remain unchanged in response to variations in the respiratory impedance of the system. In contrast, the pressure time curve undergoes changes in both waveform and values. So inspiratory flow and tidal volume becomes independent variable and airway pressure become dependent variable. Now, let us further extend our understanding of pressure control to understand how it compares to volume control clinically. In a pressure controlled mode of ventilation, the inspiratory pressure is the control variable and is maintained during the inspiratory phase. As a result of this, the pressure waveform is square. This increases the mean airway pressure. During the early inspiratory phase, the ventilator provides a high inspiratory flow rate to rapidly achieve the pressure limit variable. 
In order to maintain this pressure, the flow rate needs to decrease over the course of inspiration, and it generally takes the shape of a down-sloping ramp. The tidal volume fluctuates depending upon the lung compliance. We will use these information to understand the advantages and disadvantages of pressure-controlled ventilation. Pressure-controlled ventilation offers several potential benefits for patients with severe hypoxia and poor lung compliance. One key advantage is improved oxygenation, as it increases mean airway pressure. Additionally, it enhances alveolar recruitment by utilizing a square pressure waveform, which opens alveoli earlier and keeps them open longer, leading to better gas exchange. Another benefit is protection against barotrauma as pressure is kept under check. Moreover, Pressure control enhances patient comfort and reduces the work of breathing. It provides a high initial flow rate, which prevents flow starvation, a condition where the patient's need for air isn't met by the ventilator. Finally, pressure-controlled ventilation effectively manages circuit leaks, as it can automatically adjust the inspiratory flow to maintain the set pressure even in the presence of significant leaks in the ventilator circuit. The main disadvantage is that maintaining tight control of carbon dioxide can be hard as we don't have control over tidal volume. Uncontrolled volume can cause volatrauma, where an improvement in lung compliance might lead to excessive volumes being delivered potentially damaging the lungs. If there's high airway resistance, a rapid initial airflow could trigger the pressure alarm because it creates high pressure in the airways. In such cases, a slower, gentler airflow might help avoid this problem. In volume-controlled ventilation, the tidal volume is the independent variable and is kept constant. As volume and flow are linked, the volume control modes are generally constant flow modes, that is, the ventilator delivers flow which is constant, and stops this flow when the desired volume is achieved. Because pressure is not controlled or regulated in any way, the pressure waveform takes a parabolic sloping shape as the lungs distend during a breath. The pressure waveform is highly variable during volume control ventilation, changing shape depending on lung compliance and airway resistance. As a result, it offers a significant amount of information. Interpretation of the pressure waveform is discussed elsewhere. The main advantages of volume controlled ventilation are basically the disadvantages of pressure controlled ventilation. It ensures consistent tidal volume, which leads to a stable minute volume. This reliability is especially important when precise control of carbon dioxide levels is crucial like in case of traumatic brain injury. In volume-controlled ventilation, the minute volume remains stable even if pulmonary characteristics change. This means that if airway resistance fluctuates significantly, as can happen during the treatment of severe asthma, it continues to provide a reliable minute volume. Additionally, volume-controlled ventilation starts with a lower flow rate compared to pressure-controlled modes. This lower initial flow rate is advantageous when airway resistance is high, as it avoids creating a high-pressure peak early in the breath. This helps prevent the breath from being cut short by pressure alarms. Volume-controlled ventilation has some drawbacks. One issue is that the mean airway pressure is lower due to the sloped shape of the pressure waveform. This lower mean airway pressure may not be ideal for patients with severe hypoxia, who might benefit more from a pressure-controlled mode. Another disadvantage is that recruitment of lung units with poor compliance may be less effective. Lung units that have a long time constant and poor compliance might not be fully recruited until late in the inspiratory phase. 
This leaves these units with little time for effective gas exchange before the ventilator shifts to expiration. Consequently, the volume-controlled ventilation might result in greater atelectasis compared to a pressure-controlled ventilation. In cases where there is a leak, mean airway pressure can become unstable. The constant flow used in volume-controlled ventilation might not adequately compensate for intermittent leaks. If the rate of the leak matches the inspiratory flow rate, no volume will be delivered to the patient. Lastly, insufficient flow during volume-controlled ventilation can lead to patient ventilator dyssynchrony. If the patient's respiratory demand increases during a breath and the ventilator cannot provide the necessary flow, it may fail to meet the patient's needs.